Hello, I'm Jonathan Holloway, president of Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. Even though my comments are being made at a virtual distance, I'm thrilled to participate in this Rutgers Camden event honoring the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. I'm particularly pleased that the featured speaker today is Eddie Cloud Jr., the James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor and Chair of the Department of African American Studies at Princeton University. I will leave it to others to introduce Dr. Glaub properly, but I will just say that we are lucky to have with us today an individual whose work is at the cutting edge of critical inquiry as it relates to race, citizenship, faith, and justice. In this moment, we need people who are willing to stand up and speak with nuance, insight, and, and an unyielding integrity about the troubling state of this nation. What is troubling? Vast wealth disparities, health outcomes that are tied to one's race and income, public schools whose quality is reflected in a zip, in a zip code's wealth, gun violence and aggressive militarized police responses that poison neighborhoods and extinguish the promise of so many futures, a warped belief that a declaration of self-worth, that a black life matters, is actually an assault on civic norms and is somehow anti-American, and a shocking number of politicians who seem afraid to call a liar a liar if there's the slightest chance that supporting efforts to undermine democracy might bring them some benefit. This is the landscape, and it requires that we attempt to do what King did in his final year of his life, imagine a way forward in which we commit ourselves anew to securing justice. Over 50 years ago, King offered a multi-layered diagnosis about the state of the nation and what needed to be done. In his August 1967 address, Where Do We Go From Here?, King spoke about dignity and self-worth and the need to develop the, an unassailable and majestic sense of values. He spoke directly about the importance of power, but said that it must always be tempered by love. Power at its best, he said. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. And justice at its best is love correcting everything that stands against love. This is all as we, as we would expect, perhaps, but King did not want his audience to feel comfortable in these words. The movement, he declared, had to be brave enough to ask important questions about this country, even if these questions were unsettling. Asking a series of tough questions might allow us to see that if we are called upon to quote, to quote help the discouraged beggars in life's marketplace, we must come to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. If we are to carry forward King's legacy, if we are to claim a love for social and economic justice, if we are to declare that this country can serve as a beacon of hope to the world, we must realize that our work is not done. Doing this work means that you are unafraid to ask tough and thoughtful questions of what you find around you. It also means that you recognize that power divorced from humanity and unwilling to recognize differences is nothing more than an insecure and selfish declaration that anyone's life beyond one's own is not worth saving. And even though it seems hard to have much confidence in the assertion right now, I still believe that we are a better nation than that. And I think you believe that too. It's time we get to work. Thank you. What's the role of institutions? Where's the place, the same pressures from students, from faculty are on institutions themselves as engines. So take that look inward. You're at Princeton, we're at Rutgers. What does it mean? What's our role in this push for a just future? Well, we know that um, institutions like our own are sites for a particular kind of capital and people police access to that capital for reasons that many of us might disagree with, right? So, uh, you know, folk aren't talking about affirmative action when it comes to the local community college, right? They're talking about it in relationship to who has access to a certain kind of social capital that will give them access to these sorts of resources and possibilities, right? So what we have to do is try to democratize what we offer. We have to try to establish as our moonshot, right, our, 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 our institutions, and I'm speaking here from the vantage point of Princeton, our institutions reflecting 
right? The actual diversity of the world in which we live in, of leveraging our extraordinary resources. Again, I'm speaking from the vantage point of Princeton, um, our extraordinary resources in order to do uh, the kind of work that will produce um, uh, 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 folk, uh, well, produce graduates that actually look like the world in which we inhabit, right? If I was the president of my beloved Morehouse, right? How would I then, how would I then um, uh, systematize what is uh, one of its unique features? I grew up in Mossport, Mississippi. I'm a country boy. I took the ACT. I wasn't very, I didn't have a very good score. I went to high school on the coast of Mississippi, which is one of the worst schools in the state of Mississippi, which has the worst public schools in the country. I was trying to leave home. I hate it. I wanted to get away from my daddy. I went to a summer program because my sister was at Spelman. I walked into the office of Sterling Hudson, the admissions director, with that essay, with that ACT score that I took my junior year. And I said, let me convince you into admitting me to Princeton, I mean, admitting me to Morehouse right now. And I stayed in that office for an hour and I walked out of that office with a scholarship. Sterling Hudson saw something in me that he took a risk on, that he took a risk. He invested in me, right? Otherwise, I would have never made it to Morehouse. I would have made never made it into Princeton, right? And, you know, so, so part of what I'm saying is how do we create admissions processes that can identify those diamonds in the rough, those folk who we know, that's all they need is an opportunity, a chance, then how do we bring the full weight of our resources to bear on, on allowing them, helping them become who they are called to be, right? Institutions like Rutgers and like Princeton, we have an enormous amount of power to change the life course of the people who enter our halls. And if we understand our mission in those terms, my God, it fundamentally changes what we do and how we go about doing it. Well, our time here is coming to a close, but I think Anna and I could continue to uh, chat with you. So I just wanted to give you a moment to see if you had any final remarks before we wrap it up. You know, the only thing I can do is quote that young poet, Amanda <sighs> Gorman from yesterday. If you get a chance, read the, read the poem. Mm -hmm. It's even more amazing on the page. But she has this wonderful formulation. There's always light if we're brave enough to see it. There's always a light if we're brave enough to be it. My Lord.